I want to explain to you a little bit about tonic and facet muscles. This is a really great understanding. As soon as you have this in place, it really does transform your understanding of how the muscles affect your, your body and your posture on a daily basis. Now, a tonic muscle is a muscle that has the propensity to be tight and shortened. Now, there is a set list of muscles in the body that are likely to be tighter and usually these are the ones that are activated in a fetal position these are the ones that really flex the body and and pull it inwards compared to a facet muscle which has the propensity to be weak and lengthened and usually these are the ones that extend the body back to that neutral position so the thing we have with tonic and facet muscles is that they both are agonist antagonists so they work opposite each other and by that I mean that if you look at the image on screen now you have a bone and a joint in the middle of that followed by another bone and then these two bones where they meet you've got your joint and that joint is fine and it works perfectly well if the bones are in alignment and for that to happen you need the, the muscles to be even either side of the joint However, if one of them is a little bit tighter and doesn't like going to full range of movement, then it will literally pull the bone in so that the joint is permanently like slightly flexed, for example. But that means that the other muscle has to relax a little bit more, it has to lengthen out a little bit more. And when it's in a lengthened state, it's going to find it really hard to activate and pull back the other way. So actually, what you end up doing is you end up compounding that by making it tighter and tighter and tighter now this is all very well if you're just moving towards the tonic and back so if you just say flexing but if you move slightly side to side your joint isn't operating in a normal position and you can already see that here there would be so much more wear and tear than here the pressure is very, very different compared to how it should be sitting with a nice straight bone to bone with the joint in the middle. So it's so important to understand the difference of tonic and facet muscles. So a tonic muscle put is, has the propensity to be tight and shortened. So it's usually tight and short. And then a facet muscle is usually long and weak. Now, these are the muscles that make up tight and weak muscles in our body. Those that are prone to be tight and those that are prone to be weak. So make sure you pause the video and go through this list and really get to grips with where they are on the body. And you'll find that usually the ones that are tight are tight because they pull us into that fetal position again. They really start pulling us into a place whereby we are less effective whereas the weak ones are the active ones like the glutes and the rhomboids in the back that allow us to stand up straight so over time we can succumb to these tight muscles and as we succumb to these tight muscles our posture changes and we see these specific postural trends in clients and in people when we're moving around so we're going to look at these specific trends now as we move forwards so let's start by looking at kyphosis or another name for this is hyperkyphosis because we all have a natural kyphotic curve in our thoracic spine but it's when it becomes hyperkyphotic that we really have problems and in this place we've got some tight muscles and some weak muscles now if you just take this position now like really curve forward so tense your chest a little bit and let your shoulders separate uh, so you're protracting your shoulders and that you just medially rotate your shoulders so bring your arms sort of just in front of your body in fact you're probably already there if you're sitting down most people sit in this position now as a result your chest is activated your anterior deltoid is activated and so are your very upper traps remember the upper traps that are holding your head in place and these get really really tight and they get really short and they get overactive but the weak muscles are going to be the mid traps and the neck flexors so the mid traps really just need to squeeze and retract the shoulder blades again so that they can activate and, and really get the posture back up to normal but if someone stays like this position for a long period of time 
over time the bones and the ligaments and the fascia start to set in position and kyphosis can become a more permanent thing. However, if it's reliant just on posture and just on muscle tightness, then you can really amend this in your clients and really get them back to good posture, mostly for awareness, but also from stretching the chest muscles, strengthening the mid traps, so the mid trapezius, and encouraging scap retraction, whereby they really pull back and retract that scapula. So let's look down at the next slide. So the next one is lordosis. And this one you see in a lot of people that maybe if they sit down a lot all day and in this position, their bum kind of kicks out and their hips throw forwards and they end up in a lordotic position whereby the curve in the lumbar spine is exaggerated. So this curve here becomes massively exaggerated. Now. This again can set in over time and it can be a cause of abdominal obesity. So if you imagine that you've got a lot of weight in front of you, obesity can really cause this hyperlordotic curve whereby it's pulling the whole pelvis forwards to the point that it, it's, it's flexing and it's, sorry, it's extending the spine out in the lower area and really pinches on the back of the spine. It also can be an effect of sedentary living. So if you imagine that you're sitting down now and maybe you are sat in a triple flex position at the desk, your hip flexors are tight and your glutes are stretched. Now, if you do that at your desk and you do that in a car and you do that when you get home on the sofa, then over time, those muscles will get tighter and your glutes will get weaker. So that's why activity is very, very important. But then when you go to use those muscles, say in the gym, or when you go to use them for any other exercise and activity, you want to make sure that you activate your glutes again. But a lot of people just go with the muscles that they favor so that when they're walking, they start walking using their lower back and their hamstrings rather than their glutes. And they end up with these, this lordosis being massively exaggerated and they end up overworking their muscles and they end up with tension, back pain and more and more tilt, more and more anterior tilts. So in this position, their hip flexors are tight, which pr promotes an anterior tilt of their pelvis. So an anterior tilt is basically if you stand up now and put your fingers on your hips, so your ASIS at the front, so anterior superior spine, the little knobbly bit on the front, and also right at the back near your sacrum, put your fingers on both sides and then just tilt your pelvis forwards so your ASIS gets lower than your PSIS, which is where you put your hands at the back by your sacrum. And as you tilt that, you'll feel that maybe a little bit of tension in your spine and your back, but also you'll notice that your stomach kind of balloons. It's no longer engaged. And your glutes go weak and your hip flexors get tight. So that's really the position with the, that these people are staying in, this anterior tilt with a lordotic curve in the spine. Now, the, the secret for doing this, for helping them, is to stretch their hip flexors and stretch their lower back, as well as strengthening their core and how they activate it, and also activating their glutes on a regular basis. Alongside encouraging a good posterior tilt, whereby they're tilting their hips back the other way, will really make sure that you start to alleviate the pressure on the intervertebral discs, which at this point are at a big pressure point and potentially prevent a lot of injury. Now, it also means they can activate their muscles properly and drive through in the exercises appropriately by using their glutes rather than using their back and their hamstrings, for example. So now we just sneak over to scoliosis and usually this is a more serious um, effect whereby it isn't so much about posture, it's much more about um, a lateral curvature of the spine that actually starts moving and this can be caused by genetics, so people can be born with it, but it can be caused by carrying uneven loads for a long period of time. So ladies that hitch a child up and hold them on their hips or maybe you're carrying a briefcase or a heavy suitcase on one side a lot of the time. 
Then you want, also if you overuse particular muscles in an ineffective plane, it can start to cause a lot of stress on the ligaments, compound those muscular imbalances and physically move the curve. So you end up with a curve of the spine that from the back looks like a C shape or an S shape rather than a nice long line. And that's scoliosis. Now there can be medical intervention if it's very serious or if it's genetic. But long time exercise programming can be effective and it's really about core stability and keeping the pelvic bones as even as possible in relation to the shoulders wherever you're training your clients.